Okay, John, it's it's on you. Okay, well, it's a um, privilege to uh, introduce to you today's speaker, uh, Andrew Bocarsley. Bo I uh, has been a uh, member of the Princeton University Chemistry Department uh, faculty for 30 years. He finished his uh, Bachelor of Science in both chemistry and physics at UCLA in 1976 and his PhD from MIT in 1980. And since then has published over 175 papers in peer reviewed journals and co-authored six patents. Our research in his laboratory focused on the material chemistry associated with the elevated temperature proton exchange membrane fuel cells. Um, and with uh, this uh, chemical conversion, uh, he has been uh, instrumental in helping uh, some uh, get start some companies to commercialize this idea of uh, getting carbon dioxide into uh, other organic chemicals that can be used for fuel. Um, and let me add, Andrew, that you are among friends here at Andrews University. Uh, we also share your biblical motivation towards stewardship of the planet. We are truly honored to have an expert in the field of fuel cells and batteries with us today. And Without further ado, we're going to listen to Dr. Andrew Bukarsley. Great. Thank you very much. I've been I've been noticing that our internet connection seems to be fading in and out, and I'm hoping this doesn't become a problem. But we'll see how that that all goes. Uh, right now, I assume everybody can hear me. Okay. Yes, uh, we can. So, great. could you okay. actually send me your? um phone number because i could yeah, call you if... great idea i'll put that into the chat okay chat. yeah just in case we have to call you yeah uh, okay okay and okay okay good professor marie all right good excellent. all right okay well it's, it seems to be working right now so it's good so it's a real pleasure to uh to join you this this afternoon and um look forward to our our discussion we've been uh, working in the area of electrochemistry for oh about uh, 25 to 30 years now, and um, in particular, the electrochemistry of CO2. Before that, I was interested in water splitting, and these days, I think CO2 is a really important problem that, that needs to be addressed. I'm going to take a second here and see if I can get my screen to share. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see. We want... This one looks good here. Okay. All right. Now I think I think we are we're okay. If I get to my first slide. Okay. This is not my first slide. What just happened there? Okay. I'm gonna have to stop and do that again because this is not working correctly. Let's try it one more time. Okay. Um. Hmm. So are, are you seeing my screen now? Not, not yet. No, oh, you're not. Okay, hold on a second then. Um, oh, we do have you oh. set up for it. All right, let me get back here. Something great. Yeah, not good is happening. Uh, share screen. Uh -huh. This is the one we want to share. Share. It's coming up. Yep. Okay. Go. Good. All so, right. All right, now you should see the full screen now. Yep. All right, okay, good, get going. Uh, okay, so um, as I was saying, uh, this is a, a problem that we see as a, a very, very important problem. And uh, it's not it's not a new problem. Um, everybody here, I think, has heard of Arrhenius, maybe not so much with regard to climate change and issues like that. Um, 
But 125, actually 127 years ago, he wrote this article, which I'm showing you the front front page of in the Philosophical Magazine. One of the few papers that he wrote in English, so I can, I can read it because he was Swedish, and uh, but he wrote this in 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 English because um, he is based on a collaboration with the U.S. Naval Academy and was in the United States when he wrote the paper. Um, but there, 125 years ago, and, and he, he at the end of this paper, in this paper, he's measuring the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And at the very end, he says, you know, uh, the Earth, the world, at ground level is going to heat up because of this. Now, he actually thought that was good, because uh, who likes it? Everybody likes a nice, warmer planet, I guess. He didn't really comprehend that if it gets warmer in northern Europe, it gets really toasty south of that, and uh, there's all kinds of problems. Um, but uh, the, the problem's been around and has been known for a long time. This morning, as I was uh, driving into Princeton, uh, I heard on the radio uh, a piece that uh, apparently the European um, uh, Weather Association, I believe it is, but the, a report was just released saying this past February was the hottest month on record period. Um, and that's integrated over the whole world, so it could have been cold somewhere. But they were saying uh, that uh, the climatologists were very concerned about that, and one can see why. So, so solutions to that problem are, are a big interest of mine. Um, and when you think about solutions and you think about people, I, I find there's two kinds of people. There are people that are very concerned about the uh, greenhouse catastrophe. And, and you hear about two solutions to that problem as shown on this screen. One is that you mineralize it as underground and turn it into a rock, a carbonate. And the other is you can do something called utilize it. That is turned another chemical species that is useful and uh, gets it out of the air as a result. And, and uh, we're gonna talk about utilization today uh, since I'm an electrochemist. Um, now there's another group of people that say, oh, CO2, there's, it's there, it's not very expensive. It's free for the grabbing if you can grab it out of the air, which is not free really. Um, and, and so why don't, why don't we think about that as a feedstock for other organics? That is, what about a replacement for, for fossil fuels? And if you get those two groups of people together, then you can have a really nice cycle where we convert CO2 into a useful, either a fuel or a starting material for organic synthesis. And then we um, use it regenerating CO2, but then we can collect it again and we no longer are adding it to our atmosphere. So if we're going to make it into something, and we're going to do that electrochemically, because that's what I know how to do, then this is a this is a little graph that's taken uh, coal from the literature of CO2 and to electrochemically. Um, and sort of the biggest hits here have been um, that we make C1 products. So what we're going to do, let's see, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with CO2, and we're going to add protons to that, and that typically means water, and and electrons, and we're going to make some kind of kind of product. And obviously, since CO2 has one carbon in it, probably the easiest thing to make are products that have one carbon in it. And the way we're going to address the efficiency of how will we do that is this thing called Faradaic efficiency. And as seen on the right hand side of the slide there, that's just the moles of product that you're interested in divided by the moles of electrons you use used to make. It's, it's just like a chemical field, but it's using electrons uh, instead of starting material, right? And you can see we are very good at this point based on the literature at making uh, CO and formate, and just slightly worse at making methanol from, from CO2, all C1 products. And the CO there is, is in um, blue, because it's an interesting one. And that is at, at first glance, you'd say, why make CO? It's toxic. And we're going kind of, you know, in the wrong direction there. Um, and the answer is if, if you can make a mixture of CO and hydrogen, that's called syngas. And uh, industrial chemists have figured out how to turn syngas into just about any organic compound you want to. So that, that would be a great thing to do. And we're, we're close to doing that. But uh, and if you're stuck, that might be the best thing, best thing to make. 
If you're thinking about fuels instead of starch materials, then actually none of those materials, CO, formate, methanol, you could talk about those fuels, but they're they're not great fuels because uh, they don't have a very high energy density. When um, now, people in purple, there's some things that people have made acetylene, acetate, and ethanol. They have a better energy density, so they're a little better looking in terms of fuel. And in terms of starting materials, they look pretty good also. And is they look better typically than, than C1. Uh, when you talk to a synthetic or they have to start with a C1 material, unless it's CO maybe, but uh, so, the next set of compounds there looks good, but really, if you want to make something that both has a high energy density to it and might be useful as a starting material, a feedstock for organic chemistry, then you want to jump over to the blue materials, you know, propanol with three carbons in it, acetone, we all know three carbons, and let's go, if you do three, let's do four, let's do butanol. And the only problem you see with butanol there is uh, we don't know how to make it. That is, look at the efficiencies are less than 5%. Um, so, and what I'm not telling you is there are exactly three papers in the literature that claim to make butanol. Um, so uh, we don't know how to make it. At least very many people don't know how to make it. And even those that know how to make it um, can't do it very efficiently. So it's uh, not practical at all compared to the, the other materials. Well, we've been working the last couple of years to make butanol electrochemically. And we published a paper uh, about nine months ago now on, on that topic. And uh, we're very excited about that because um, we're claiming that we can make butanol very efficiently. So we've taken that kind of three or 4% Faradaic efficiency, and we're now up to 42% Faradaic efficiency for, for butanol. Yeah, in a reaction, actually, it takes CO2 to organic in general with about 80%, 70 to 80% efficiency. So we, th we think actually turning CO2 into useful molecules is possible now, and, uh, and maybe even practical right around the corner. Um, so that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So when people started doing this, the first electrode material discovered, and it was quite by accident, that was the first thing noticed, was see that sitting there on my periodic table. Some other things from copper uh, using CO2, that is, it was electrocatalytic for converting CO2 into a variety of organic things that were either C1 or C2 products. Um, and for the C1 products, quite high, quite high yields. And so people said, well, okay, I should tell you something about copper. Electrochemists don't use copper as electrodes. No, no one would think to look there for it. It's a, it's a poor electrode material in general because it tends to corrode. But it was found by accident and people said, oh, lots of other poor electrode materials out there. Um, maybe some of them are good for reducing CO2. So um, they scoured the uh, periodic table to see what might work. And in particular, uh, a researcher in Japan, Professor Hori, uh, looked at everything and we've taken his results and we color coded them and put them on this periodic table and and basically his results are that everything that is if you take aqueous co2 co2 dissolved in water uh touch it just reduces the water to hydrogen which is fine but that's not what we want to do is that one things in orange oxide the things in yellow will make a uh, formate or formic acid. And only, only carbon has been shown to make carbon-carbon uh, bonded products. So all that work, carbon, and we said, there's gotta be something else that does it. It just doesn't make sense that it's only copper that will take uh, CO2 and make these other materials. So um, we, what's going on there? It doesn't wanna go forward. Okay. So we went and started thinking about how we could electrocatalyze other reactions. And before I tell you about how we succeeded, I have to tell you a story. We, we have these junior papers at Princeton. And one year, I had these three juniors that were assigned to me. And the idea of this junior paper, one of the things is, is simply to learn how to use the chemical literature. Um, and so I had these, these three juniors. 
and I said, okay, we're going to think about CO2 reduction. And um, I want you each to go out to the chemical literature and come back with something interesting you could convert CO2 to. And then we'll have a discussion about what you should, uh, what we should actually make. We'll see what the best thing is. So I, I had this one student came back and said, oh, I found this very interesting chemistry out of Cornell where they were reacting CO2 with some natural products uh, from citrus trees. And they made a, a plastic, a polymer out of that, which is very similar to the polymer that's used to make Tupperware. So we can make Tupperware out of CO2. So that sounded good. And then my second student said, you know, if you take, if you take CO2, you can reduce it all the way down to elemental carbon. And elemental carbon is used for various things. One of its big uses is it's the black in tires. So why don't we turn our CO2 into... Uh, carbon black, and we'll make tires with it. Now, I don't think he had in mind this picture I pulled up of a trash heap of tires, but it's a good use. Carbon black's an important material, and we might have made that. And then my third student, you always have a student like this, said, oh, Professor Bocarsley, I know how to turn CO2 into methanol, which we did at the point that we were, I had this interaction with these students. We should obviously do your chemistry and make methanol from CO2. So, okay. So I, um, then I said, okay, now we have to figure out all these three things you could do, which would be the best thing to do with CO2. But before, before uh, we decide that, you need to know the following fact. A large coal-fired power plant in the United States, and there are several of these in the Midwest, there are smaller ones, but this is a large one, a gigawatt plant, generates a thousand pounds of CO2 per second, and it runs mm -hmm. 24 hours a day. Hmm. So if you want to solve the CO2 problem by making one of these products, you have to convert it at a rate of a thousand pounds a second. And the student who suggested we make Tupperware said exactly the right answer. Nobody could ever use that much Tupperware. <laughs> so the answer to this problem is there is not one chemistry that it's good to turn CO2 into. We need lots of solutions, making lots of different things because we generate so much CO2 that if you want to utilize it, there's no one thing you can convert it into. You need to develop all kinds of new chemistry. So I'm going to tell you about one kind of chemistry this afternoon, but there's a lot more that uh, that one might, might do uh, with this chemistry. So just keep that in mind as I am talking here. Okay, but we're all start my sales pitch. Uh, is is right here uh, on the left. We can see um, Stephanie. She's one of my advanced graduate students. And the right hand side of the screen is Alma. That's another advanced graduate student. And they're both working on the CO two research in my lab right now. Stephanie Dulovic and Alma uh, Hernandez Gonzalez. And um, Stephanie pointed out by looking at the literature this graph that she put together on the left-hand side of the screen. And she said, if you want to turn it into a fuel, then obviously the competition is gasoline. So let's look at the energy density that's stored in gasoline. And she's showing it two different ways. On the horizontal axis, you have gravimetric energy density. But how many materials can you do something, get something per kilogram of material you have? And on the vertical axis, we have volumetric energy density. That's how many megajoules you get out per liter of the fuel that you have. Now, if you're in a car driving along, the really important number is the uh, volume, volume because you have a gas tank. It's about 20 gallons. Fill it up every 10 minutes. So you want to know how many uh, megajoules can I stuff into my gas tank? So, and you'll notice the gasoline is way at the top of the graph there. Now. The volumetric density is an, important also because uh, we don't want things to weigh too much as we drive down the road or bog down our car. But you can see that's a volumetric job on gravimetric energy in their car. Um, and hydrogen is on volumetric energy density. But horrible on excuse me uh, on uh, metric energy density, but horrible on volumetric. That is, even at almost 700 atmospheres, high high, um, it's not. Horrible. 
so run out of hydrogen very, very quickly if you decide to use that. Okay, well, there's other organics that are listed there. And I just want to point out to you that that butanol is right below gasoline. It's not a bad competitor for gasoline. And the primary reason for that is the main component of gasoline is uh, octane. And octane is just two butanols. So, uh, interesting. Okay. So we have this little graphic on the right-hand side that, that Stephanie came up with. We're going to stitch together our CO2s made um, carbon products like butanol. And our catalyst, special catalyst for doing this is going to be nickel. We've got a nickel needle in there. Now, it turns out the story is not that simple at all. If you just take a nickel electrode, much like people take co copper electrodes, and you put it in a so light, you'll make hydrogen. It was one of those red elements on that periodic table I showed you. So we have to do this in a kind of tri tricky way. And the tricky way is to get a chromium oxide, gallium oxide mix involved with this. So we make an electrode that is a carbon electrode. You can see it in, in part A here. The, the black is the, um, is the carbon. And um, on top of that, we have this this mixture of chromium oxide and gallium oxide. And it's all very homogeneously mixed together, but it's a mixture, it's not a solution. Um, and that is uh, synthesized actually on the electrode surface. And even when you look at it, such as you see in figures C and D, which are SEM, scanning electron micrographs of that surface, you can't pick out separate areas of, of chromium oxide and gallium oxide. It's very, very homogeneous. And that's also confirmed by the X-ray uh, powder uh, data, X-ray diffraction data shown in part uh, B on this figure also. Okay, and to that, we're gonna add a very, very small amount of nickel. We electroplate on a trivially small amount of nickel onto that surface. Okay, and once we do that, we start off first without the nickel present, and we look at that surface very careful, carefully, and in part A there, there's the, the that's diffracting in part B and C. We're looking at the X-ray for the crop, the copper and the chromium and the oxygen. Uh, in part C, that's a scanning electron micrograph of the surface. So you can see now, you'll notice that there's a bar on there. It's 20 microns is the length of that bar. So we're looking at things there that, that are about five microns in size. And then on the right-hand side, the slide there is another type of uh, SEM data called EDEX X-ray, which uh, just shows us various elements. And you can see it's versus areas that are oxide. Um, so we have a very homogeneous surface of chromium gallium oxide. We put that nickel in there now and it becomes catalytic. That whole is only about 10 microns thick. So a uh, typical hair, human hair is about a micron, maybe a few microns thick. So this is a, a few human hairs in thickness. Um, and so we make it into an electrode. We put it into a CO2, aqueous CO2, that's uh, about pH four to four and a half. And that's because when you dissolve CO2 in water, it's acidic and that's where we end up. So it's a solution that's buffered around there. And then we um, change our electrode potential as shown in the bottom of this slide to, to various uh, different potentials. And we, um, by, by using gas chromatography and NMR, we analyze the products that are coming off the electrode. And we see on the left there at almost minus 1.5 volts, minus 1.48 volts, that there's a big spike in that blue stuff. And if you look on the right and the key there, that's one butanol. So that's our major product right there. And that's what we're very interested in making. And you can see the Faraday efficiency there is a little over 40%. There are other interesting things that we make, but we're focusing on the butanol because it's the largest molecule that anybody has ever made from, from CO2. Another molecule that's interesting, not as a fuel so much, but as, as a feedstock for organic products, a starting material, is this butanal, this aldehyde that we make, this 3-hydroxybutanal, which is the pink. Curves. And you can see by changing the potential, we can pick between the blue curve and the pink curve. So we get to select what we want. If you really want to know all the details about this, uh, and there's a lot of details, then this is uh, at the bottom there is the paper we published 
uh, last year in uh, Journal of American Chemical Society, and you can look up probably more things you, than you'll be interested in knowing about this. But one other thing that is interesting to know is that not only is it dependent on the potential of the electrode, but it's dependent on the pH of the solution. And so uh, as we change the pH, we get different product distributions. And you can see a pH 4.1 is sort of the magic pH for making butanol. So if we're at minus one and a half volts and pH 4.1, we make a lot of butanol. Uh, enough butanol to think about this being a, a process you could take out and out of the university lab bench and, and, and upscale for actual industrial application. Mm -hmm. So that's our big finding. Now, we discovered this quite by accident. We did not design this. I'd love to be able to sit, you, sit here and tell you we were so brilliant, we made this up, but this was totally a laboratory accident. Uh, that we came up with this this material. And you can see it's a complicated material. It's got chromium oxide in it and gallium oxide in it. It's got that little bit of nickel, which is very important, and it's sitting on a carbon electrode. So it's a big kind of materials chemistry problem. Um, and um, we have therefore been spending a lot of time trying to figure out why does this stuff work? Why does it work so well? And um, the first thing to tell you is it shouldn't work. It's lucky to design it because you would never design uh, an electrocatalyst for CO2 this way. First reason is the two oxides that we have there are insulators. And as a old gray haired electrochemist, I will tell you, if you want to make an electrocatalyst, don't make it out of insulators. <laughs> Needs to conduct, but they're, they're insulators. Okay, number one. Number two is that carbon electrodes, a glass carbon electrode that we use is ex totally ineffective at making CO2 into anything. It doesn't touch CO2. It's also an effect of, by the way, taking water to hydrogen. So we don't get CO2, we don't get hydrogen off, off of this electrode. And I'll point out, if we're gonna convert CO2 into an organic molecule, other than maybe CO, you need hydrogen because of course the product is gonna have both carbon and hydrogen in it as a bare minimum. And then, then finally, this is subtle, but we start the currents we were observing are just way too large. Okay, I'm going to show you some data that I'm going to turn you all into electrochemists in the next couple of slides. Um, so first of all, let me teach you quickly about a technique called cyclic voltammetry. And first of all, uh, I want you just to pay attention to the black curve on this on this graph. Now, on the bottom axis, we have the potential of the electrode, and we get to control that. We have a potential stat that lets us set that. And on the vertical axis, we have the current that's generated at various potentials. So for this particular experiment with the black curve, we took ferry cyanide, the inorganic complex shown on the left hand side uh, of the slide, iron surrounded by six cyanides in an octahedra, and the iron is in the three plus oxidation state, so it can be reduced to the two plus oxidation state. And so we're gonna carry out the chemical reaction on the top. No CO2 involved with this at all. We're just picking this reaction because it's a very well studied reaction and it's very well behaved. So we wanna use this to characterize our surface. So we, we run this first, the black curve on a pure clean carbon electrode. We start at, at plus 0.6 volts versus a silver silver chloride reference half cell. And we scan negative to minus 0.2 volts. And the first thing we see is a downward going peak. That's the reduction of the fair E cyanide to iron to fair O cyanide. And then when we get to minus 0.2 volts, we tell the machine to turn around the potential and start scanning positive. And uh, then we see the reoxidation of the thing we just reduced. The, the uh, reduced fair O cyanide gets reoxidized. So we see a peak for that. And we get back to plus 0.6 and we're right where we started, okay? With exactly everything we have. Now we do the same thing. This gallium oxide on the surface. Green curve, okay? And you'll notice that the currents on the green curve are larger than the currents on the black curve. My first thought about that was that's impossible. Why? Because this, these oxides we put on there, remember, are insulators. So we covered up part of the surface, at least. With an insulator, there's less surface area available. How is it possible that the current goes up? Yes, the current. Yeah. So it's got to go down and it goes up. So this is really confusing. Did our surface area somehow get bigger or, or something has happened? So we did another experiment. Oh, and by the way, I should tell you, when I say we, 
I'm a professor that never wants to get, to get oh, I love to get in the lab, but never is allowed to get in the lab anymore. I got all that other professor stuff. And so these experiments, these last two experiments I just told you about are Alma's experiments. And that first one with the SEM, that was Stephanie. So Alma decided she was going to do something called silver under potential deposition. And it turns out you can put down, like the graphic shows on the left-hand side here, a monolayer of silver metal onto our carbon electrode by holding it at a, at a particular potential. Okay. And then on the right-hand side, what we're showing is if you scan from zero to plus 0.6 volts, you can strip off that silver. And, and so if we uh, integrate the area under that curve, that's a way of measuring how much silver was on the surface. And we know it's a monolayer, so it tells us how much surface area is available. Okay, so we do that uh, on a clean surface, and that is a black curve. And then we put our, um, our oxide down on the surface, our mix of oxides. And again, we lay down our, our silver, and it goes all over the place and whatnot. And we strip it, and now you see the green curve on the right-hand side, and it's smaller, you'll notice, in the upward going direction than the black curve. That is, there's less area under the curve that's green than under black. And that's exactly what we expect because there is less electrode area available when you have this insulating oxide on the surface. So we, we know we've lowered the area of the carbon carbon electrode by putting the oxide there. And then yet yeah, we had that fairy ferrocyanide result a second ago that says that the current goes up. So it can't have to do surface area. The current goes up for other reasons. Okay. Um, so that's, the, that's when we do the stripping experiment. And this just simply points out the only place that the silver can deposit is right on the carbon surface. It can't go everywhere because it's an insulator. Uh, when it's on the oxide, it doesn't carry any charge. It can't reduce the silver ions to silver metal. Okay, so, so here's our hypothesis. We have this oxide, which is shown by these yellow green things on our, our surface, and they're, they're incomplete. They're not all over the place. We're showing them here as little pillars. And it turns out if you do some careful uh, SCM work, electron microscopy that Stephanie did, this oxide is porous. So you have, you have areas of oxide and, and you have areas that are open uh, where the carbon can see the solution out there. And so the electrons for the electrode are going to, to the carbon. It can only get through the electrolyte to the solution where there's no oxide. And in these pores, CO2 is, is held captive, if you will. It is a prisoner in the pores. And that's very important because to convert CO2 into butanol takes 24 electrons per molecule. And it doesn't happen in one step. And so if that's going to happen, that CO2 and its intermediates have to sit or near that electrode surface for a long, long time. Okay, so it's stuck in the pores. And the other pores do regulate the pH um, near the electrode surface side. Okay, so uh, what's the problem? Well, if we have too many protons around, we'll make hydrogen. Remember, nickel likes to make hydrogen. We don't want that. If you have too few protons around, you can't make organics like butanol because there's no hydrogens around to make it. So we have this buffer system locked into these pores where we just supply the protons as needed to make the products. Okay, and I happen to show acid aldehyde there as a product. It's one of our intermediates, but a bunch of stuff gets formed in here and then we spit out butanol. Okay, so we think that's, that's our model for how things work. And actually life is complicated, okay? Uh, th this is the actual mechanism. And it's um, it's complicated. You start over here on the upper left with with CO two. You you go through ten steps, and when you get to the bottom left, you make end up making butanol. You make a lot of intermediates, and there's lots of good reasons to think that this is the mechanism. And if you're an aficionado of organic mechanisms and or electrochemistry mechanisms, then I'm going to redirect you again to that paper I told you about earlier, that Jack's paper, because it has this picture in it and it goes through it in a lot of detail but the only thing i want you to get out right now is it's complicated it involves 24 electron protons okay. intermediates that have to be held near the electrode surface for a prolonged time in order for this thing to work out okay and let's see uh and then uh, let's see, going on. Okay, so, and okay, nickel is important here. Surface hydrogens are important here. And I'm just showing you the key steps where, that nickel plays. 
Okay, how do I know that protons are, are being uh, held at the right concentration of electrochemistry experiment? We take some benzoquinone, and benzoquinone can be um, reduced to hydroquinone, and that's two electron on reaction. So you need electrons and protons around to do that. And when you just do that in water, you get the black cyclical tamogram shown on the right-hand side. And the technical term for that black cyclical tamogram is ugly. That is an, one ugly cyclical tamogram. The peaks are far, far apart, they're broad. And because it involves a very complicated mechanism that requires two protons and two electrons, and it's a mess. Okay, and that's what you see at a carbon surface without the um, benzoquinone. It's when you can now, the presence of benzoquinone. They're close together, they're tall. That's a two electron charge transfer. Now, it's not a two electron, two proton charge transfer, it's a two electron charge transfer. It's happening in the pores and there aren't enough protons in the pores to do a two electron, two proton charge transfer. So the pores, even though the solution's got lots of electrons, uh, protons in it, the pores are proton poor. And it's the oxide that's just leaking those protons in as needed because of its buffering capability that allows all this chemistry to happen. Okay, that just shows you that, that 90 millivolt peak to peak is the magic that tells us that that's what's, what's happening there. Two electrons versus two electrons, two protons. So we have a, we have a, a proton poor uh, electron rich interface that allows the solution protons in as needed. And that is the magic of that surface for, for uh, allowing uh, nickel to uh, convert CO2 into butanol, okay. So we decided, okay, that's that's nice, but we're not sure we should believe this because if you take a, a very high resolution, a, a transmission electron micrograph of our surface, you get the picture on the far left there. And it's a very complicated surface. And yes, we can see pores. So we look at it carefully and we can see lots of other stuff. And it's consistent with the model that I showed you a few minutes ago, the cartoon, but it doesn't look anything like the cartoon to the naked eye really. So we decided what we need to do is make electrode surfaces that have this sort of morphology. So, so Stephanie went and made surfaces, and you see them on the right there, um, that have specific size pores in them. And she did that by um, taking a silica particles that she made at specific sizes, 35 nanometers up to 450 nanometers, and pouring our, our, our oxide precursors over that, and centering the whole thing and then etching out the sodium hydroxide that was in, excuse me, the silica was sodium hydroxide. And now at the bottom here, we're left with these porous structures. And we can do electrochemistry now using these porous structures and uh, shown on the prior slide right here. When we do that and we look at the Faradaic efficiency in blue or the con oops, what happened there? concentration in red, we see that as we change the size of the pores, we're getting uh, different concentrations of product. Here, we're just looking at the acetic acid we make because this particular data is taken without the nickel around, so we don't make butanol. Okay, so we're starting to get a handle on, on how the pore size affects all of this. But um, it's still a little bit of a mystery, and we're still still working on that. But we think that overall, our hypothesis seems to be panning out that it's the pores that are the magic, and it's some nickel in the pores that carries out the catalysis to generate the products uh, that we're interested in, the, the butanol uh, and the other, uh, other products. Okay, there it is, right? Okay, so just to sort of summarize all of this, we have that oxide surface. It's got these pores in it, and at the bottom of the pores are some nickel particles, small amount of nickel that can touch the, the uh, carbon and get electrons from the carbon when we apply a potential. The CO2 gets in there, it gets trapped in there, and that's where all the catalysis is happening. And it stays in there long enough to make C4 products, to make butanol and the butanal, things like that. As well as molecules, I did, I, they were on the slide like acetone and isopropanol and acetic acid, we're making all those things, but I was really focusing on the, the butanol because it's the biggest molecule that we can make and the one that we're most excited about because it's a real life fuel.
So that, that is my story. I just need to acknowledge the wonderful research group on the bottom right there that did all this work. Takes a lot of people to do this. Um, and uh, some key people are mentioned by name on the left. And I have to thank Princeton's Department of Chemistry and the NSF for providing the funding to carry all this out. And I need to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. A uh, question. I still am trying to figure out how did you guys, you said it's accidental, you know, serendipity. <laughs> the catalyst, like you had to come up with three different metals. You have to have them in the correct ratio. Oh, could you give us a little bit more? Oh, uh, you, right you go right for the killer question. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So I think the simplest answer is divine intervention, but <laughs> <laughs> here's what happened. Um, so <laughs> it's a horrible story. Uh, basically, if you make enough mistakes, it might work. <laughs> Usually that doesn't happen, but in this case. So um, there was a paper published by Nate Lewis, who's a professor at Caltech, an electrochemist, a good friend. And he pointed out that, um, remember I told you that only copper makes carbon carbon bonded products. He was looking for something else and he found out that an intermetallic alloy of uh, nickel and gallium mm. would start to make some C2 products, ethylene in particular, in just a couple percent. And um, nobody seemed very excited about that except for me <laughs> um, because no one had found anything besides copper and here he found something else, even though it wasn't working very well. And so um, we started looking at that and we said, okay, well, if nickel and gallium work, what else works? And we started just making different alloys. And we settled on the three to one ratio of metals in those alloys because that makes a, a well-known intermetallic and, we, and that would give us some reproducibility. We'd always get three to one. Uh, so we picked three to one because we knew we could reproduce that with all kinds of different metals. Okay, so we did that, and we thought we were making in this kind of survey an alloy of, gal of gallium metal and chromium metal. Hmm. And so we made that, and we and the first thing we did after we made the alloy is we just we made it on an electrode, and we did the electrochemistry with CO two and, and checked to see if we made something interesting. Um, and we never analyzed it until we said, "Oh, it does something interesting." So we did that. And this particular set of electrodes started making oxalate in very high yield. And we were very, very excited about that because it's got a carbon-carbon bond. Mm -hmm. And here we were in water with CO2 and we we're making a lot of oxalate, like 62% for DIG efficiency. Mm -hmm. Okay, and things are going along great. And that was work that was done. Oh, she's not in, is she not in this picture? It's done by Aubrey Paris, who graduated somehow. She's not on here because I didn't talk about her work. And then she graduated and we couldn't reproduce it. We were making a teeny bit of that oxalate on, on alternating Tuesdays, basically. Mm. And, and we're struggling with that. And then um, actually, while, while Aubrey was still there, I had another student who is not shown here also because she wasn't working on the project, but she gave a group meeting and Aubrey said, well, we made this, uh, you know, this intermetallic and, and Jessica, Frick, who was sitting at the group meeting, said, as she was staring at the powder pattern that uh, we got from it, that's not chromium gallium. <laughs> now, that's a little surprising because the way we make this is we start off with the nitrate salts of chromium and gallium. We heat them up to drive off the water uh, from the solution that we put them into. And then we throw the whole thing into a furnace under hydrogen gas mm -hmm. to reduce it down to the metal. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, careful analysis of the powder pattern showed it was that we were making the oxide, the chrome mixture of chromium and gallium oxides. And that was just ridiculous because we were under hydrogen. How do you how do you start off with chromium ions and gallium ions, put them under hydrogen, under heat, and then make an oxide? This yeah. is a bad recipe. Right? Uh, it turns out, long story short, because it took forever to figure this out, we use the nitrate salts because Nate Lewis used the nitrate salts and the oxygens coming from decomposition of the nitrate. Oh, okay. Oh, who would have guessed that? Okay. 
And anyhow, the story's longer than that, but we won't go there. So we, now we know we have the oxide. Okay. And the oxide's making oxalate, and then, then Aubrey graduates, and the oxalate's not working, and then Steve. So in the bottom picture, that big guy in, with the red shirt on the left-hand side of the picture, Steve Lovely. Cronin, just, just a postdoc with me. Um, great guy from Kentucky. And he's looking at this. He wasn't even actually working on the project to start with. He's looking at this. He goes, do you notice there's an awful lot of rust around your potentia stats? And I said, yeah, well, we use stainless steel for our alligator because we went up, but things just tend to rust. There's salt water around. He goes, well, that rust is getting into your electrochemical cells. Do you think that might be an issue? Mm. So he started taking ions separately uh, and throwing them into the electrochemical cell with the CO2 and the chromium and the gallium. And uh, one at a time. And... Um, he discovered, uh, you know, stainless steel. So what ions are going to throw in the uh, metals, ions of the metals you find in stainless steel? Well, there's iron. He threw that in and did some stuff, but it wasn't good stuff. Uh, and then he threw in nickel, which is the second highest concentration element in stainless steel. And we started seeing butanol. Hmm. At that point, we said, well, we don't really care about oxalate that much. We're making butanol. We'll study that. <laughs> so that's how it happened. Just a, just a series of... of lab errors yeah and that entire process because that's what i was also wondering is the mechanism and then you showed it on the slide yeah. but showing it on the slide doesn't mean i mean it's complicated right it is. Oh, yes it is well you should love it you're an organic chemist uh, uh, yeah i see aldo react <laughs> aldo reactions I have a confession to reactions, make. dehydrations, reductions, yeah. so all kinds of When I was an undergrad, I did not find organic chemistry very um, pleasant. <laughs> I loved inorganic chemistry, all that coordination chemistry, but organic chemistry and I just didn't sit well together. And, and my punishment for that is I find now as a <laughs> professor, I have to do organic synthesis <laughs> and mechanism. <laughs> And the complex way. In a very complex way. So actually, so Steve, um, who I just mentioned to you, and Stephanie um, worked out all of that mechanistic information. And it took about a year. You're right. It was not trivial. Could so you show it again? Could you show that slide again? Yeah, let's see. If we, well, maybe. Yeah. If the machine will cooperate with me. It was, oh, I'm going to be able to. Yeah. So, Okay. So do you guys recognize any reactions here, like going from eight to nine? Yeah. You guys recognize a reaction? <laughs> like yeah, I was really disappointed to see that. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me explain to you how we work these out. So uh, first of all, we have dished out of solution by NMR or GC, all of these things, with the exception of that, uh, that butanal number, mm -hmm. number nine there. Nine. Uh, uh -huh. Which has to be there more or less. Um, so the all the things in blue, we've both isolated from, from our electrolyte. And in addition, we've done a series of experiments where we don't put CO2 in, we just put the blue chemical in and see what happens. And so, for example, if I don't put CO2 in, but if I go between step two and three there and just put formate in or formic acid, then I will get all the other products in that chain um, out of there. If I, if I go down to step number between seven and eight there and uh, just put in the acetic acid or the acetate actually, mm -hmm. uh, then I'll see the, the rest of the products, we'll see the acid aldehyde and the butanal and whatnot. Right. So, so we, we've gone through and, and done all those intermediates that we can get our hands on and they follow, they jump in the chain right where they're, they're showing. We have NMR data for all the intermediates. Um, we have a mass spec, what? We got very fortunate, I think. We have a mass spec. The, 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 we didn't, when we took the mass spec, and for that, that matter, the NMR, we had both proton NMR and C13 NMR. We, we always do C13 experiments because we're not making a huge amount of product. And you know, someone could be 
walking around with acid aldehyde outside the lab and our NMRs are very sensitive and they could end up in our cell. Um, so we always do C13, starting with C13, CO2 to make sure we're making the right stuff, the stuff that comes with CO2. Anyhow, when we see uh, butanol, we always see it bound to a metal. And the NMR, you can't tell what the metal is, just that it's bound to a metal. But mm -hmm. when you do the mass spec, it's bound to a nickel ion. Oh, okay. okay. And it turns out that not only does the nickel, we nickel ion we saw by mass spec, not only, not only had a butanol ligand, it had a butanol ligand also. It had that, it had that, that hy hydroxybutanol. So we think we caught the intermediate by accident in, in the mass spec mm -hmm. going from uh, nine to 10. Okay. okay. So we so, have a question in the, in the chat. Um, are the products biodegradable? I'm assuming the butanol, yeah. I think butanol yeah. might be. So, so actually but it used to, butanol these days is made totally synthetically. It's a, a, a major component in, in paint for walls. Hmm. Um, but it used to be the primary synthesis of butanol was a, a bio uh, synthesis actually, way back when, back in the, this is before bio was, was popular. This is back in the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. It was biobutanol was made. It was made by fermentation. And then people figured out how to make it from, from, from uh, oil products. And it, it was a cheaper way to make it, actually from syngas. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the bio process got, got lost. And recently, uh, now that people are more interested in you know, chemical biology and, and more environmentally favorable reactions, the biobutanol is starting to make a comeback. Um, so this is a process that does not use a, a biological, it's bio-inspired, but it doesn't use a biological intermediate. Um, but it's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty nice process in terms of uh, being, the intermediates are gonna be deco decomposable by, by mm -hmm. fermentation, yes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, a final process might actually go to one of the other intermediates and then use a biological step, a fermentation step to generate the butanol. Right. right. So um, you could imagine feeding, uh, for example, you could do more than imagine. You could imagine feeding, for example, formic acid, because we've done this, mm -hmm. uh, to the appropriately in a genetically engineered bugs and making products that way. Okay. So you make your formic acid electrochemically, and then you you do a hybrid biosynthesis. So we are losing our audience. <laughs> the hour is getting late, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we want to um, thank you very much for this presentation and giving us some insight, some inorganic chemistry that uh, is useful in making uh, organic compounds. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Okay, yeah. I'm just one minute, but I'm just personally, you guys, if you don't, you know, if you have something you can yeah. do. That step between five to six, isn't that a kind of zero where you, it it's is like, yeah, I, yeah, and I think I think our reactions get involved in the CO two reduction a lot. I mean, if you look more broadly than the chemistry I showed you, a lot of different catalysts. Yeah, it's very easy to imagine kind of zero reactions. The interesting thing about them is they're they're happening in in water, right? So, um, but yeah, I think that's quite reasonable. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Then it's in water, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is really I, interesting you know. work. So is there um, any attempt to, I know you came across the catalyst in a you know, roundabout way. Is there any, any attempt to try to optimize and make better catalysts? I'm pretty sure you guys yeah. are thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah, you're picking up on me. Uh, is he frozen? Okay. Yeah, he may be frozen. 
Did you just get? Uh, yeah, I think you were frozen there for Okay, a we were. Yeah, we were frozen there, but I think you're back. Yeah. I'm back. I'm back. So you were. You were asking. I think about optimizing the catalyst so, to see if this you. Is more... So, and I froze again. So I don't know if you're or not. You know what? I, you know, I think I, I'm. I'm going to turn off the sharing and see if that helps. Maybe. Okay. Bandwidth. Stop sharing with you. All right. Okay, let's see if that's better. Okay. Um, so on, on the one hand, we, we really want to know the mechanism. Are you good now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay. So we really want to know the mechanism, not because we want to know the mechanism when well, we do, but but because we feel that if we knew that, we could start designing things. You're right. right? Uh, so that, that's the one side. The other side is, there's a lot of materials chemistry here in terms of how you make that electrode. And we're not going to be able to get at that rationally, if you will. <laughs> so we, we do have a program to synthesize a wide variety. So, you know, we can take, we can say, we know this mixture of oxides is good. What if we change the metal from nickel to something else? What happens? Right, right. Uh, doing that. And then we can say, okay, well, let's keep the chromium oxide, for example, the same, but aluminum oxide is kind of similar to gallium oxide. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. What yeah, what, what happens there? And the final thing, which I, I showed you a little bit of what that Stephanie's doing, where we're, we're we're using chromium and gallium oxide, but we're now templating our structures um, instead of just letting nature make what nature wants to make and, and see what the relationship is between structure and right, the product. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. Because this, yeah, this is nice, but we really have to get a handle on for... it to for... Yeah. yeah. It's I actually have a question too, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I just a trivial question, I guess. And I, I my electrochemistry. Yeah, so there's a lot to do here. I'm Send sorry. some good undergraduates to us for graduate school. Yeah, yeah the the sound is kind of like. Go ahead, yeah. Dave. So, at any rate. You know, if you try to scale this up to an industrial process, where are all the electrons going to come from that are going to do all this reduction? I know it's a kind of strange question, but where are they going to come from? You blanked out again. Where are the electrons going to come from if you scale this up to an uh, industrial, industrial reaction? From a source. Actually, hold on one second here. Let me see if I can find a picture. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to have to turn on sh screen sharing, but I want to see if I can find this picture first uh, before I do that. Let's escape. Uh, oh, I threw it out. I don't have it in this presentation. Oh. Okay, I do. All right. This is the one I want. Okay, hang on. Let's see if I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. So this this picture on the uh, whoops, that's not what I want. Where'd it go? Share my screen down. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Uh huh. Okay, good. So that that was done out at Liquid Light, the company that is no more. Um, and what you're looking at on the right there is a commercial solar panel that comes from our local utility. They've stuck these on all the telephone poles in New Jersey. And they lent okay. us one. Um, and on the left is a three-stack. So uh, we are not seeing the CO2. image. We are not CO2. seeing the image on the right. We're not seeing the no, image. Yeah, no, I just keep I'm just I'm just, I'm just I'm just showing you the left. Okay. But right hand side of the left picture. Okay, okay, okay. That's the solar array. Right. But on the um on the telephone. That's a commercial solar array. It's about five feet by three feet. And on the left side of that picture, there you see those three cells. Uh -huh. Those are liquid light cells. Hundred square centimeters each of active surface area, and there's some plumbing there. We're we're we're, we're plumbing CO2, aqueous CO2, uh, mm -hmm. through those cells. And in the on the 
right hand side of that apparatus we're collecting in this case is formate that, that we're making but that that's a system that you could implement today using sunlight to make these products you, it's making a metal and you don't you don't need to use fossil fuels to do it okay Okay. okay. I'm gonna get out of this again. Dave, that answers your question. Yeah, I suppose. So I mean, I, 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 I really, I guess I'm simple-minded, but you know, the 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 solar panels promote the electrons from low energy, Pro high energy, uh, and then that's, you know, they then uh, are you know, shuffled off and provide power, uh, but that's in a loop. Uh, Aren't you capturing uh, uh, those? For real live industry, in, in um, the and or, so and you can you can do you know if you didn't want to do it with power up, if you're up in a nice hydroelectric. You can, it, sure, that's fine. You know, yeah. So we have on the top of the chemistry building at Princeton, we have solar cells. The university we've got they don't run a lot of the building, but they run a part of the building. Sure, those solar cells put out 550 volts. Okay. The gang together, 500 defaults. Because when they put them up, I said, oh, this will be really neat. Can I like borrow a little of your electricity so I can tell people I'm doing solar electrochemistry? And they said, well, yeah, if you can handle 550 volts. volts yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let, those let things are forward, right? pretty yeah. impressive. <laughs> yeah. Well, interesting work. I'm glad serendipity, yeah. the role that serendipity plays in. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, that that it shows it nicely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a Chinese proverb that you know the, the, the teacher teacher shows up when the student is is ready or something like that. In other words, that that you had to be prepared to be willing to be taught by an accident, right? Mm -hmm. Someone well, else might have yeah. just discounted what they did and just moved on, but you were you were primed to be ready to accept and, and I have to say being taught from this. The, you know, the people in my lab, they had all kinds of opportunities. It, this, it was all by accident, but it was because they were very good obs at observation. Mm -hmm. It was kind of yeah. passed by and we'd have nothing, but they saw it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And they realized it was meaningful. So, yeah, absolutely. Obs yep. Ob observation yeah. is key. That's right. And this is just where years of work can bear fruit in a single day or a single aha moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. never give up never give in <laughs> right <laughs> okay thank you so very much i'll be looking very good well i'm coming from your lab thank you for the opportunity okay then take care you too all right bye bye, bye.